Hi, everybody. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a kind of a recent experience I've had over the last, say, six months where I've worked with a couple of development teams, both as a Python dev and as more of a DevOpsy role, where we weren't using Docker in production at all. Uh, we opted to use it in the development environment, and my belief now after that experience is that it's totally sufficient reason to check it out because of the sort of very tangible efficiency gains you can you can make in a development context. So we're, we're ruling out the production stuff completely and focusing on the development context. I'm gonna give you a couple of like very concrete examples of how this works with like a mock project that I'm working on. And uh, we can take a look at sort of what the strengths are of Docker in a dev environment. Okay, so quickly just starting off, I wanna address this idea of contextual appropriateness because some apps don't fit in a container. Uh, if you're modifying things at the kernel layer, um, uh, well, as, just as a quick side note, I'm going to assume you guys know uh, a little bit about containers at this point because Docker and its competing technologies have been around for a while, but a kernel is outside the scope of a container, so if you're modifying firewall rules or doing things at that level, your app is probably going to be more cumbersome in a Dockerized dev environment, so you probably want to look at something that's more traditional like Vagrant or VirtualBox. Um, that being said, if we focus on, uh, again, purely on the development context, we're not looking at the, the, the deployment uh, uh, advantages that Docker might bring, but purely from the development context, if we, if we center on what I think are three key things that Docker does well, we can sort of evaluate if your app might be able to take advantage of these features and, and improve how your team works. The first one is this idea of managing dependencies. So, um, you're not gonna get anywhere with Docker until you sit down and start writing your own Docker files. And they are essentially, and I'm gonna actually take the slide off here and just show you a Docker file. I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen it at this point, but they are, uh, they are essentially lists of uh, bash commands that you run to set up the environment that your app is gonna run in. So here I'm running a package manager for Alpine Linux and I'm installing some pretty trivial packages like bash and curl, but I'm also doing some stuff in pip. Um, just by doing this, and you, you, you need to do this, like you can't get around using Docker without doing it, but just by going through this motion, you are creating a reproducible recipe of all the support uh, packages required to run your app, and my coworker with his Linux desktop running Docker can also run this and get the exact same result, so his app will run exactly the same way as mine, and the new guy can walk in the door, slam his laptop down, install Docker, run a shell script, and he'll get his environment booted up right away so you're not fighting with like the wiki for three days reading somebody's notes from like five years ago and that is a special kind of hell that I have been through. Um, so just jumping back to my slides here really quickly, um, I want to jump to the next uh, sort of concrete advantage it brings and this is this idea of compartmentalization. So. I don't think Docker is a philosophy, and I don't want to sound like a salesperson for them either, but they do, they do advocate an approach of using one process per container. And if you do this, there are some very tangible advantages. Uh, the first thing that may not be ev evident right away is that you can version all your support components. So, okay, I, you, you packaged up your Django app, it runs in a container, that's cool. Now you can package up your database and your cache server and you, maybe you have a celery worker that you're gonna put in a, a container as well, and they all have their own dependencies, and they're all wrapped in their own Docker files, and they can be swapped out. And let's try and do that. Hopefully this doesn't blow up, but we can, we can try it and see what happens. So I'm gonna go up a layer of abstraction to a Docker compose file, and this sort of aggregates together a bunch of Docker files. And what I'm looking at here is my Postgres version. And I'm quickly gonna swap it out here and I'm gonna make it 9.6 instead of 9.4. And I'm gonna run some helper scripts here to sort of reboot the environment. And the idea here is that, um, I don't wanna type all these commands by hand, and most guys will do this or create a bunch of like bash aliases to do this kind of work. But the idea is when you're done and everything comes back up, you should be able to look at your processes that are running. And hopefully everyone can read this. It's still coming up. But uh, you can see that my Docker environment now is running 9.6 for Postgres instead of 9.4. Well, that's kind of cool, it's great on my laptop, but if I check that one character change in and push that, now my whole team is running 9.6. So it's like, 
you're enforcing a set of dependencies for your application, that's great, but you're now you're also, support, you're, you're also sort of enforcing standardization amongst all your support applications as well, and it's super quick to roll out to your whole team. So that's a, that's a reason you might want to check this out. Um, well, the other thing I was going to talk about really quickly is just this idea of uh, the logs for all the containers, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this already too, but you can just sort of do Docker logs and type in the name of the container and you get the spew of log output from each container. So if you're working on a new feature and you want to jump around and sort of uh, uh, figure out what's going on cross processes, this is super easy for troubleshooting. Um, a lot nicer than jumping through three VMs and trying to find like where the exact var logs file is that you're looking for. Okay, uh, advantage number three. This is, uh, this is the thing that I think is the coolest and it's this idea of container ecosystems. Um, okay, it's great that you can run all these wrapped processes, but as I, uh, as I sort of alluded to before, you wouldn't run, um, like you wouldn't run a database by itself. That's super boring. Uh, you want to run your, your, your Docker containers together to support your application, and you want to get them to talk to each other. And the way that Docker does this is that they've implemented this idea of like virtual networks for your containers. So this is, this is like another view of what's running on my uh, laptop right now. And you can see this green backplane network. That's a virtual ne network that Docker has created to allow my containers to talk to each other directly. And you can layer one or more of those on here. So uh, for example, Postgres and Django could have their own private network for talking to each other. Um, what may not be, what you might not see right away when you look at this is this is basically a VPC in Amazon, and these are just stand-ins for instances. So you could, model, uh, you could model your production network on your laptop before you ever spend a dollar on cloud, and you can imagine how much more realistic your dev environment becomes when it is analogous to your production environment. And again, I'm not using containers in productions. I'm talking about using, um, I'm talking about using AWS instances and uh, a VPC. So you have the ability to model things that are a lot more lifelike now. Uh, and uh, it's worth noting too that you also have a friend plane network where I can run tools on my local machine and access, the, access all these resources that are running. Uh, like I could run the Redis CLI on my laptop and talk to the Redis instance, no problem. Which kind of leads me to the sort of the last point here. And I wanted to talk about how you get the code into the container really quick. And it's, it's actually the easiest part of all of this. Um, Docker has this feature called mounts that used to be called volumes. Uh, it's this idea where you take a local folder on your machine and you sort of open a window in the container and allow it to read and write to your host system directly. So now I can just like fire up my IDE and play around with the code like right on my, uh, right on my machine here, make changes, and I can see them in real time in the, uh, in the app itself. So I can just Put super easy in here. But once this is all set up and everything's running, this code inside the container will seamlessly read the code that's mounted from my laptop, uh, from my laptop's hard disk, and I can just interact with my IDE the way it is. It sounds like super complicated, but uh, it actually just kind of works, which is, which is sweet. Um, okay, so just to summarize really quick, uh, it does three things super well in development context, uh, this dependency management stuff, compartment compartmentalization, and this container ecosystem stuff. So if your app, like if you're gonna go to cloud or something like that, you might, you might really wanna think about this. Um, if you're managing stuff that doesn't fit in a container, you're just pouring a bunch of water into a small cup and things are gonna get messy. So if you're doing stuff with the kernel or you're managing like other parts of your machine from inside a container, that's sort of an anti-pattern and it doesn't really work. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say, so I want to thank you guys for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.